Hey guys, welcome back. Now that you've taken some notes and you've had some time to look over them and decide what you want to focus on, it's time to get our hands dirty and start making our very first prototype. You ready? Welcome back, I'm Zach with Streamline Design and today we're going to be looking at making your very first prototype. Now, first you may be thinking, what the hell do I need to make my first prototype? Well, the answer is actually pretty simple. You probably have all the stuff laying around your house. For instance, maybe I'm the only one who does this, but pens. Lots of colored pens. Extremely useful. Really, you don't need multiple colors. So long as you have a pen, you will be okay. I just find colored pens are kind of nice and making stuff work well. Next, we also have tape. Again, technically not needed. Very helpful, though. You can make a lot of things that normally you would either have to balance or keep shifting just by taping it. You fix that complete issue, and again, most people have it around their house, so it's really easy. Third, we have note cards. Colored note cards, to be exact. I only have two right here because I'm actually running low myself, but colored note cards come in handy greatly. For anything that's going to be randomized, you can, in fact, just use a couple of note cards, each with different things written on them, and that'll tell you what's going to happen at any given time. The different colors can mean different things. Maybe one's an event, maybe one's a monster. The fourth thing you guys will need is probably the most common, and it doesn't have to be this kind. I have plain old printer paper. You can use notebook paper. It works fine. I like printer paper because it's easier to draw on and you can see stuff on it better because you don't have the lines getting in the way and it's kind of annoying. But paper, probably the most important thing. You could do everything with paper and a pencil if you wanted. Now, it's a little nicer looking if you use some other stuff, but you can cut these up to make cards. You can color on them, you can write on them or put designs on them so you can tell them apart. It's really not hard, it's really cheap. The last thing you'll need are scissors. Because this makes cutting all that paper up really easy. And you'll see later on when I give you some examples of what I've done for some very first prototypes, how much easier it will make it. So now that you have some materials to work with, let's go back to your idea of what you actually want to make. All of the ideas for a game can be broken up into kind of their core mechanic. Now, some examples of those would be exploration, platformer, 3D maze, FPS, RPGs, racing games, and quite a few others as well. The key here is to not only figure out what the core of your game is, but also to figure out what the minimum viable product is. Now what that means is what is the minimum you can have in your game and still have it be that type of game. Now some examples of a minimum viable product would be, for instance, on a platformer. What do you need to make a platformer? Do you need monsters or anything like that to kill you? No. You really just need platforms that you can walk on or land on, a character, block, box, circle, some sort of shape or something to represent you that can move around and jump. Now, you could argue that you need some other things that would make it a lot easier to test, but that's really all you need. Then maybe you want to make a puzzle game, 3D. Maybe a maze. What would be required in that? There's a number of games that are effectively giant mazes with some other stuff thrown in. And that's really what it is. The only thing you need for that is a camera to represent you, because you're probably going to be first person view in this. So you have a camera that you can move around. You have some walls that stop you from moving in certain directions and some openings in those walls so you can move around a little bit and find your way. The key here with both of these is really you want it to feel good. If the core of the game, the minimum viable product, if it does not feel good, your game is going to have problems later on and they're going to be very hard to diagnose. Now, keeping the minimum viable product in mind, let's look at two examples I've made for some projects I'm either working on or was working on a little while ago. Here you see an example of a game that I wanted to make something explorative. I wasn't exactly sure where to go or what to do, I just knew I wanted an exploring game that was turn-based. So I decided to break out some note cards to act as some random events and 
cut them in half to make them a little more manageable. Put two characters there, that way you could see the more turn-based actions. And then started moving them around and exploring. Now you'll see I drew some stuff on here to kind of provide some uh, blocked paths and stuff like that. And I drew a little design for moving into different sections. But it's pretty much just moving around the map in a way that is orderly and quick. The quickness is what kind of got me thinking this would make a good board game. Because there's other board games that rely on the same simple turns that are very quick to keep people engaged. So I figured, let's keep it as a tile-based game and move forward with it that way. Now this is something you might actually want to consider. Maybe your game is going to be more suited to a board game. And of course, maybe it's going to be more suited to an RPG or a video game of a, some other sort. But be willing to admit when your game fits a different genre better. Because you will have a better product in the end when you do that. Now this other example is one that I started as a puzzle platformer. And it evolved from there, but this was the first go at it. What I did for this was I cut out a little guy that I drew, plopped him on a stick with some tape, and then proceeded to cut out some strips of paper, cut one of them in half, kept one of them long, and then used some leftover pieces of scrap to make a wall at the beginning. Now what this did was it allowed me to make differing heights to see what scale looked good with the character and how the character can move when he's jumping and moving back and forth to look smooth and just feel good. That's going to be a great reference for taking this to a 2D game platform. You can also see that I added a single item here as well as a little sparkly thing to kind of act as the end of the level or an unlocking thing. The key is surrounded by white so you can see it better on the camera. It wasn't originally. The character jumps around, grabs it, and then is able to go through the portal. The second one, you see it's slightly puzzly just to kind of get a feel of how it would look and work trying to jump up something that you couldn't jump up. So he jumps down, tries to jump up, can't do it, falls off the, jumps off the side to die. He shows up back at the top with the key. And that's pretty much the basis of the prototypes. They don't have to be anything complex. They don't need anything crazy in them. You simply need to get a feel for how it works and whether or not it is engaging. Because that's going to be the key to moving forward. Next time, we'll be going over the different tools available to you for developing the different types of games. Whether that's a 2D platformer, a 3D FPS, or a board game. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to give me a thumbs up if you learned something, and don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you want to learn more. And, as always, let me leave you with a question. Have you ever had a game idea, or an idea in general, that you thought would go one direction, but as you started to develop it more, and think about it, and put more into it, it all of a sudden took a huge turn? I want to know what that turn was. Let me know in the comments below, and I will see you guys next time. Bye.